Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Herald podcast, normally recorded in our studio at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre, currently recorded from our volunteers' homes. To keep in touch with us, use our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter, which are all at Q&Review. That's C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W. Or get in touch via information at qandreview.com. That's information at C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W dot com. Please like and share our podcasts and give us any constructive feedback. The Herald, Wednesday the 27th of July 2022, News. COVID Scotland, cases of BA275, Centaurus variant found. This article is by Helen McCardle. Cases of a new COVID variant which has spread rapidly in India have been identified in Scotland. Genomic sequencing has detected a total of 24 cases of the BA.2.75 strain, nicknamed Centaurus, in the UK, including three in Scotland, according to the UK Health Security Agency, UKHSA. The true figure is likely to be substantially higher as only a fraction of positive PCR results go forward for sequencing and COVID testing is no longer routinely available in the community. Virologists have described BA 2.75 as a wild card and suggested that it could displace the UK's currently dominant BA 5 Omicron variant. It was first identified in India in early May, where it appeared to be outcompeting other Omicron sublineages and has been classified as a variant of interest by the World Health Organization while monitoring continues. The European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, ECDC, designated BA 2.75 as a variant of interest on July the 7th, with the UK HSA following suit and officially describing it as a variant under investigation on July the 18th. This means there is not yet enough evidence to upgrade it to a variant of concern, for example, if it was shown to have substantially increased transmissibility, virulence or immune evasion. BA 2.75 was dubbed Centaurus on Twitter, but remains part of the Omicron family. An offshoot from BA 2, it has nine new mutations, including eight relating to the spike protein, which could make it even harder for COVID antibodies to latch on and prevent infection. This would not affect cellular immunity from T cells, which protects against more severe disease, and there is currently no evidence that BA 2.75 is any more harmful than existing strains. Dr Tom Peacock, a virologist at Imperial College London, who was the first to identify Omicron as a potential concern back in November 2021, said it's hard to predict the effect of that many mutations appearing together. It gives the virus a bit of a wild card property where the sums of the parts could be worse than the parts individually. It is definitely a potential candidate for what comes after BA5. However, writing in the conversation, Ben Krishna, a researcher in immunology and virology at Cambridge University, said there was not yet clear evidence proving that BA2.75 is spreading faster than other strains. He stressed that there had been no big increase in deaths or hospitalizations linked to Centaurus in India and that its growth advantage may only have applied in regions where it wasn't competing against BA5. He added it seems to have shown an increase which has leveled off or even dropped relative to a few weeks ago. If this is the case, there's a chance it might even fizzle out in another few weeks. But if BA 2.75 does have some immune evasion properties, it could cause another wave through the UK and elsewhere, 
Still, this would likely spike and then fizzle out like Alpha, Delta and Omicron BA1. Megan Call, an epidemiologist at the UK HASA, cautioned that the virus could be running out of new potential new hosts to have much impact given the Omicron BA1, BA2 and BA5 waves of the past six months. Writing on Twitter, she said, by the time BA5 wave is done, approximately 75% of English population will have been infected with Omicron. Leaves very little niche for BA 2.75 to make a ripple, let alone a wave. That said, BA 2.75 may well cause new waves in countries where BA 4, oblique 5, haven't yet dominated, such as India, and severity is as yet unknown, so still worth watching. It comes as the latest update from Public Health Scotland reports that the Omicron BA5 variant is now responsible for around 70% of COVID infections in Scotland, based on data up to July the 17th. However, there were also signs that the BA5 wave has now peaked in Scotland. In the week ending July the 24th, a total of 8,911 positive COVID cases were reported in Scotland, of which 2,053, 23% were reinfections. This is down slightly on the previous week, and while based on very limited availability of testing, correlates with a decline of COVID patients in hospital. The PHS report states, There has been a recent decrease in cases reported to PHS, including the number of Omicron BA5 in Scotland. This follows a sustained increase in cases, primarily of the sub-lineage Omicron BA5 in Scotland. Omicron BA4 has remained stable over the last few weeks after an initial increase. Omicron BA5 is now the predominant variant in Scotland, surpassing Omicron BA2 and accounting for 70% of newly reported sequenced cases. The most recent surveillance by the Office for National Statistics estimated that 1 in 15 people in Scotland had COVID in the week ending July the 14th. This was up from 1 in 16 the week before, but continues to show a slowdown in the spread of the virus, which had previously increased rapidly from a rate of 1 in 50 at the end of May to 1 in 18 by the week ending June the 24th. Figures updated today also show that the number of COVID positive patients in hospital has declined by 8.6% from 1,733 on July the 17th to 1,584 by July the 24th. The hospital data, which acts as a gauge for community prevalence of the virus, indicates that the BA5 wave may have peaked around July the 13th, when there were 1,804 COVID patients in hospital. This compares to a peak of 2,406 on April the 2nd at the height of the BA2 wave. Current analysis suggests that only around a third of the COVID patients in the hospital have been admitted with the infection as their primary diagnosis. This article is by Helen McArdle. The Herald, Wednesday the 27th of July 2022. News. Nikki Campbell, Edinburgh Academy Abuse Affected My Life. This article is by Jodie Harrison. BBC presenter Nicky Campbell has claimed that he was the victim of abuse at a Scottish private school during the 1970s. The broadcaster, 61, said witnessing incidents of both sexual and physical abuse at the Edinburgh Academy had had a profound effect on my life. Campbell made the claims for the first time on an episode of his podcast, 
different on BBC Sounds, released on Wednesday. During the episode, he discusses his experiences with journalist Alex Renton, creator of the radio programme In Dark Corners, which explores abuse at Britain's private schools. Campbell will later tell BBC Radio 5 Live, I was badly beaten up at school by a teacher who was a leading light in the scripture union. My mother took it as far as she could and got a grovelling apology from the man involved, but was essentially stonewalled and it was hushed up by the school. Those were different times and that has stayed with me all my life. Campbell also discussed witnessing more serious sexual abuse, allegedly enacted on his schoolmates at the hand of another man at the institution. I cannot describe it here and I can never unsee it, he will tell Five Live. This man was known to us all as a predator and a sadist, but we never told anyone. My school friends and I talk about it now with each other, with again contempt, disbelief and incomprehension that that sort of thing happened in plain sight and nothing was done. And why didn't we as little boys tell anyone in power what was happening? I don't know. It was also revealed to Campbell by Renton that the alleged abuser is still alive but has not been named for legal reasons. The broadcaster, 61, said witnessing incidents of both sexual and physical abuse at the Edinburgh Academy had a profound effect on my life. Speaking on his own podcast, Campbell says the reason he has chosen to come forward is to bring the man to justice over the alleged abuse. In a statement provided to the PBC, Edinburgh Academy said it deeply regrets the alleged incidents and wholeheartedly apologised to those involved. We have worked closely with the relevant authorities, including Police Scotland, with their inquiries and would like to provide reassurance that things have dramatically changed since the 1970s, the statement read. The Academy has robust measures in place to safeguard children at the school, with child protection training now core to the ethos of the Academy. Different with Nikki Campbell is available on BBC Sounds. This article is by Jodie Harrison. The Herald, Friday the 29th of July 2022, News. Cure heart scientists aim to cure hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This article is by Caroline Wilson. When Josh Moncrief was diagnosed with the condition at 18, doctors said it was the worst case they had ever seen in someone so young. A keen footballer at the time, the 24-year-old is aware now what his fate might have been. The Scot is living with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, HCM, the inherited disease of the heart muscle that caused the then 23-year-old footballer Fabrice Mwamba to collapse during a game in 2012. It is also likely to have caused the death of Motherwell and Celtic footballer Phil O'Donnell at the age of 35 in 2008. Scientists now believe an injectable cure for inherited sudden death heart conditions could be available in a matter of years after being given a once in a generation opportunity. A team made up of world leading scientists from the UK, US and Singapore has been given £30 million by the British Heart Foundation, the biggest ever non-commercial grant to pioneer ultra-precise gene therapy technologies that could offer hope to the 22,000 Scots affected by genetic cardiomyopathies. The Cure Heart team will attempt to correct or silence the faulty gene, which produces an abnormal protein in the pumping machinery of the heart. Where the faulty gene does not produce enough protein for the heart muscle to work as it should, the team plan to increase the production 
of healthy heart muscle proteins using genetic tools. The technology has already been proven to work in animals and on human cells, and scientists believe the therapies could be delivered through an injection in the arm that could stop progression and potentially cure those already living with the condition. It could also be used to prevent the disease developing in family members who carry a faulty gene. When he was 12, Mr Moncrief's chest pains were misdiagnosed as scoliosis, which causes a scurvature of the spine. He was finally diagnosed with HCM six years later after he suffered severe pain down the left side of his body during the night and was rushed to A&E. He has now been fitted with an implantable cardioventer defibrillator, ICD, which help control any potential life-threatening heart rhythms. Six years on, the device has never been triggered, but he is aware that the future is uncertain. His 10-year-old niece Mia also carries the faulty gene. He said, when I first found out, I was doing a lot of sports at college. Who knows what could have happened? It's that wee glimmer of hope from the research. I try not to think about the what-ifs because it can be quite daunting. The possibilities and how the diagnosis is could affect you. I try not to think about potential life expectancy or heart transplants. If they could find a cure, I could start thinking that wee bit further in life. If they could detect it at an early age, it would be brilliant because obviously I've got family that have got the inherited gene. Hopefully my niece will never develop it, added Mr Moncrief, who works for ScotRail. In many cases, multiple members of the same family will develop heart failure, need a heart transplant or are lost to sudden cardiac death at a young age. Professor Sir Neelish Samani, medical director at the British Heart Foundation, said this is a defining moment for cardiovascular medicine. Not only could Cure Heart be the creators of the first cure for inherited heart muscle disease by tackling killer genes that run through family trees, it could also usher in a new era of precision cardiology. Once successful, the same gene editing innovations could be used to treat a whole range of common heart conditions where genetic faults play a major role. Fabrice Momba revealed earlier this year that his three sons have inherited the faulty gene that led to his collapse on the pitch. It is 10 years since the 33-year-old suffered a cardiac arrest during an FA Cup match between Tottenham Hotspur and his team, Bolton Wanderers. Medics were able to get his heart beating after an astonishing 78 minutes. Following medical advice after being diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, HCM, Mwamba announced his retirement from professional football in August 2012. He has three sons with wife Shauna, Joshua, 13, Matthew, 8 and 5-year-old Gabriel and a daughter, Zuri, who was born in November 2020. He said his boys had been scouted by Liverpool FC, but the couple had pulled them out after they were told they had inherited the RMB20 gene, which can mutate at any time. This article is by Caroline Wilson. The Herald, Friday the 29th of July 2022 news. Unions warn they have a mandate to disrupt 1,200 Scott schools as row erupts over pay dispute talks. This article is by Martin Williams. Unions have warned that they have a mandate to disrupt the operation of over 1,200 schools across Scotland after thousands of local government workers voted for strike action in a pay dispute. The warning has been made to the employers, the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, 
Kozla on the eve of discussions that were thought to be taking place today, Friday. The unions had warned Kozla that the only way to avoid strikes is for council leaders at their meeting on Friday to put forward a substantially improved pay offer. But a COSLA leaders meeting unions hoped would happen on Friday over the dispute is not now taking place. Unions had hoped that the discussions would help try to end the dispute over a 2% pay offer to local government workers. COSLA has been warned by the unions Unison, GMB and Unite that it has a mandate to disrupt schools in 16 of Scotland's 32 local authorities. They said they had a further sanction to disrupt waste and recycling services across 25 local authorities. Unions have said the strikes could take place as early as mid to late August after pupils return from the summer break. They have to provide two weeks' notice to employers, the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, COSLA, of any action. But COSLA, which is appealing for more money from the Scottish Government, says there has never been a leaders' meeting scheduled for the end of this month, as they were in summer recess. We will, of course, bring our leaders together once we have met with the Scottish Government as leaders have been requesting, said a COSLA spokesperson. A strike ballot of around 25,000 members of the three unions voted to reject the final 2% pay offer in cleansing, schools and early learning sections. The three unions raised concerns with COSLA that they had not convened a meeting of the negotiating committee since March the 4th, and said the newly elected COSLA Resources spokesperson had made no effort to engage with the trade unions on this pressing matter or any other since taking up post. Our negotiators remain willing to make themselves available at any time to help facilitate a speedy resolution to this matter, the unions said. Viewed across all occupational groups and trade unions, There would be few, if any, councils that would avoid some level of disruption, they said. The only way to avoid this now is for the council leaders at their meeting on Friday to put forward a substantially improved pay offer. You will wish to note that council workers in England, Wales and Northern Ireland have just received an offer of a 1000 £925 flat rate uplift, which equates to a 10.5% increase for those on the lowest wages. Joanna Baxter, Unison's Head of Local Government, said, This is appalling behaviour by COSLA, who seems set on a course for strikes and disruption. The COSLA lead on local government has not engaged with us, despite our negotiators making themselves available. We are legally mandated to disrupt the operation of over 1,200 schools and the waste recycling services across 25 local authorities in Scotland. It is urgent that we try and find a solution to the problems on pay. Otherwise, few, if any, councils will avoid some level of disruption. A GMB source said the pay awards are influenced by the budgets that are set by the Scottish Government. It was felt that 2% was unfair against inflation, running at 9.7%, and the Scottish Government backed pay settlement of 5% for ScotRail train drivers that may well rise to 10% with performance bonuses. In March, the public spending watchdog warned that Scotland's councils face significant financial challenges amid funding cuts handed down by SNP ministers. The Accounts Commission found local government funding reduced by 4.2% in real terms 
between 2013-14 and 2020-2021, once COVID cash was excluded. Trade unions representing 200,000 local government workers across Scotland have already written to COSLA to say that councils have failed to come up with an acceptable pay offer for workers whose pay have been held down for too many years. The Scottish Conservatives have criticised the Scottish Government for passing the buck to COSLA and the unions to resolve the dispute. The issue is around a proposed 2% pay rise with a 20 pence rise in the minimum hourly wage at £9.98, 8 pence more than the real living wage, while inflation was running at 7%. There was concern that the rise was inequitably benefiting higher paid workers, while the 50% who earn less than £25,000 a year were losing out. The union said that those earning over £40,000 a year, 12% of the local government workforce, would get an increase of more than £800 a year, while some will get as much as £2,000 more. Meanwhile, those who earn below £25,000 would get a pay increase of just about £500. They say after years of below inflation pay awards, Council workers should be given a one-year £3,000 flat rate pay rise for the next financial year and for the minimum rate of pay to be increased to £12 per hour. They also want an agreement that in future, all allowances are automatically uprated in line with October inflation rates. The Scottish Government has said it has no formal role in the pay negotiations but said it is working with COSLA to explore options available to find solutions. Megan Gallagher, Deputy Leader of the Scottish Conservatives, said council workers are threatening to strike after rejecting an offer of 2%. Yet, despite the huge disruption this strike might cause, the SNP government are passing the buck and dodging responsibility, even though they have been more than happy to hollow out local government with huge funding cuts year after year. The SNP government must get round to the negotiating table and thrash out a deal to prevent this strike. It is, after all, their systematic underfunding of local authorities that have left councils unable to increase wages for workers. This article is by Martin Williams. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 1st of August 2022, in the Voices section, Doug Marr, the housing crisis is a failure of will. When we oldies get together over an old teen or two, we don't agree about much. There is, however, one topic over which there is little dispute. None of us would want to be young nowadays. Our generation has had the best of it enjoying lives infinitely better than our parents and grandparents. Worryingly though, the generational escalator is no longer moving onwards and upwards. The engine of social mobility has stalled, as demonstrated by the housing crisis impacting most heavily on the young. Reaching even the first step in the property ladder represents an almost insurmountable challenge. TV presenter Kirsty Alsop's opinion that the young can't afford to buy because they spend too much on coffees and Netflix is laughable. Perhaps she hasn't heard of zero-hour contracts, job insecurity and flatlining incomes. In Scotland, the crisis is acute in certain areas, for example around Edinburgh. The BBC's disclosure programme revealed the average price of an Edinburgh flat has risen from £164,000 to £236,000 since 2011. At the same time, rents have soared, driven by higher buy-to-rent and Airbnb. Ten years on, The social housing waiting list is not uncommon. My granddaughter, currently in a placement in Leith, is paying an eye-watering rent for a one-bedroom flat. There's little prospect of youngsters like her saving even a minimum deposit when shelling out hundreds of pounds in rent every month. Government initiatives such as First Home Fund helped thousands of first-time buyers, but were too short-lived or restrictive to make a lasting impact. 
That makes it even more important to meet its 2032 target of 110,000 affordable homes, 70% for social rent. I'm not holding my breath. Research by the Resolution Foundation offers little comfort for young, would-be homeowners. According to the Foundation, around half of millennials, born in the 1980s and 1990s, will still be renting in in their mid to late 40s. Around a third might still be renting when they reach the pension age. A Lloyd survey of 18 to 34 year olds was equally discouraging. Only 20% had a mortgage and 16% were still living with their parents, usually unwillingly. A further 10% had largely given up, believing they will never own their own home. Around a third believed that an inheritance would be their only route to property ownership. The surveys confirmed that inherited wealth now makes a bigger contribution than earnings to someone's resources spread over their lifetime. The Institute for Fiscal Studies has highlighted the importance of having better off parents and the intergenerational per- persistence of wealth. It's therefore the offspring of wealthier parents are most likely to be property owners by age 30. That's all very well for those who have richer parents and grandparents, but where does that leave those with no prospect of inherited wealth? The unfairness and dangers of that situation are obvious and strikes at the very heart of a society based on merit and hard work. Alan Milburn, former Labour Minister and Chairman of the Social Mobility Commission, points out that the rungs on the social mobility ladder are growing further apart. The persistence of wealth inequality, especially in terms of property ownership, is creating an us and them society. The feeling of being left behind has already already contributed to the rise of populism and may well have been a major factor in the loss of Labour's so-called Red Wall. It's possible the housing crisis will produce a generation of highly discontented and detached young people. Yet, it's a crisis that can be solved, as was demonstrated in the years after the Second World War. During the war, around 2 million British homes were destroyed, making many millions homeless overnight. It simply became another challenge, amongst a great many others, for Clement Attlee's post-war Labour government. Between 1945 and 1951, one and a quarter million new council houses were built, many prefabricated and erected on site. The difference being, Attlee's government had the vision and above all, the will to solve the problem. A similar approach to the current crisis would see the development of a national strategy with a focus on the young, greater use of modern prefabricated building techniques and stronger regulation of the rental market. As Attlee himself might have put it, where there's a will, there's a way. And that was an opinion piece by Doug Marr. Our columns are a platform for writers to express their opinions. They do not necessarily represent the views of the Herald. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 1st of August 2022. From the opinion section, Leslie Riddock, have non-political figures become the new opposition? By columnist Leslie Riddock. Have people, people's heroes become Her Majesty's unofficial opposition? And is that okay? Money expert Martin Lewis has earned unprecedented prominence in the cost of living crisis, calling for Britain's zombie government to take urgent action to prevent £3,500 energy bills. He's challenged Richie Sunak and Liz Truss to meet Boris Johnson immediately and hatch a plan to stop a winter Armageddon with characteristic straight talking. Sit in a room, decide what you're going to do, take collective action and give the panicking people across the country some respite. Lewis is no overnight success, founded the Money Saving Expert website in 2003 for £80, starting his own primetime ITV series in 2012 and clocking up a net worth of £123 million today. But though he's in the Rishi Sunak League, consumers don't seem to care about the wealth of their saviour, because his work to help folk avoid the worst financial pitfalls is apparently never-ending and always timely. In March, he probably launched a million photographs by urging energy users to record their meter readings before the first price cap rise. That's a clout no political party or campaigning charity seems to possess. Meanwhile, the writer and activist Jack Monroe dogged campaign to highlight higher than average rises in basic supermarket food prices forced the Office for National Statistics, ONS, to dramatically widen the number of products it tracks. This followed a long flight 
long fight by the poverty campaigner to prove that basics like pasta, rice and jam had all increased in cost by much more than the ONS estimates. Monroe launched her own price index with economists, campaigners and former ONS staff to document the disappearance of budget lines from supermarket shelves and the insidiously creeping prices of the basic lines still there. As a result, ASDA announced it would, be a stock, it would stock low-cost ranges in all 581 food stores immediately. And, of course, there's man news Marcus Radford, who shamed the British government into providing free summer school meals during the 2020 pandemic, drawing on his own experience of going hungry as a child. After that success, Rashford convened a Child Food Poverty Task Force and tweeted pictures of miserable government food parcels, forcing Boris Johnson to U-turn again and promise free school meals to families and benefits during the Christmas, Easter and summer holidays of 2021 as well. His Twitter campaign is now in the curriculum for pupils taking GCSE media studies. What have these people's heroes got in common? Jack Monroe still lives in the breadline, but Marcus Ratchford and Martin Lewis are multimillionaires. You could argue wealth makes him fearless, but whilst other millionaires can be generous to charities, few launch overtly political campaigns against government policy. They are also street-talking, stubborn characters who simply refuse to be co-opted. Jack Monroe was embraced by Good Morning Britain, but doesn't observe broadcast niceties, recently pointing out a fellow guest financial connections with big energy companies. She's pushed back against the Bonnie Fechter image, and he's not being framed as a competitive, combative or de- demanding simply for politely asking that all people are represented equally in national statistics. Martin Lewis was made an OBE in 2014 and received an MBE this summer, whilst Marcus Shadford got his gong last year. But that hasn't stopped either man from b- biting the hand of the nobles. So, have these people's heroes been lucky, hardworking, clever, or all of the above? Certainly, the media prefers high-profile one-off campaigns by celebrities with a conscience to the worthy party political union and charity efforts that slug away for years. Labour actually got pelters for the Johnson School Meals U-turn after tweeting, We did it. Thank you to everyone who campaigned for hashtag holidays without hunger. Labour supporters were quick to comment that it was Rashford's campaign, not Labour's, that galvanised public opinion, which in turn prompted the government's change of heart. One political commentator said, This unelected footballer has exerted more influence in policy than many MPs might do in the totality of a 20-year backbench career at Westminster. But is that fair? Leaving political parties aside for one minute, what about the doughty campaigners who've been thumping away for years without the prime Good Morning Britain TV slots that give such high profile? Undoubtedly, Citizens Advice, Joseph Rowntree's Foundation, UNICEF and Radio 4's Moneybox presenter, Paul Lewis, have all pushed in the same fronts as Ms Monroe and Mrs Rashford and Lewis. But there's the rub. Lewis has a preference for the unusual, the cogent, passionate individual and the very particular issue. Perhaps their visibility problem is ironically related to the length of time they've been campaigning. Meanwhile, bias wary BBC presenters generally won't campaign against the government the anti-hunting stance of Springwatch's Chris Packham being a bold exception. But how long do heroic wins last? The ONS is now using millions of price points instead of thousands, and Asda still stocks its full basic ranges. But benefits remain effectively frozen, and some English councils have slashed the value of summer school meals vouchers to £1.66 per day, just half the amount handed out during Rashford's campaign. Meanwhile, in Scotland, Without fanfare, but doubtless with quiet lobbying by the anti-poverty campaigners who pushed through the Scottish child payment, free summer school meals are available to families on benefits. As usual, without personality campaigns, same in Wales, this might suggest Tory governments are less responsive to ordinary lobbying efforts than devolved governments until adverse publicity focuses minds. But there's another common factor. The People's Heroes have carefully chosen massive single-issue campaigns that focus on human rights, staying warm, finding affordable food, not political change. Indeed, when fans pleaded with Martin Lewis to become the next Chancellor of the Exchequer after Rishi Sunak's recent resignation, 
He may have been told it's 1.5 million Twitter followers. I'd rather wire my nipples to electrodes. It's relatively easy for the media to back humanitarian arguments by insistent individuals. But Britain desperately needs regime change. And with Keir Starmer inching ever closer to the Tories, who will deliver that? And that was an opinion piece by Leslie Riddick. Our columns are a platform for writers to express their opinions. They do not necessarily represent the views of the Herald. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 1st of August 2022. From the Voices section, Obituary. Nichelle Nichols, who played Lieutenant Uhura in Star Trek and was key to its measures of diversity. By Mark Smith. Born December 28th, 1932. Died July 30th, 2022. Nichelle Nichols, who has died aged 89, was an actress, dancer and singer who was best known for her portrayal of Lieutenant Uhura in the groundbreaking science fiction classic Star Trek. She starred in the original 1960s television series and six successful films in the 1980s and 1990s. As a member of the original cast alongside William Shatner as Captain Kirk and Leonard Nimoy as Spock, Uhura was the crew member who famously opened and closed the healing frequencies. However, as a black woman, she was also central to the show's mission to promote diversity and the progressive future. She performed TV's first interracial kiss with Kirk, and when she considered quitting the show, it was the prominent civil rights activist, Dr Martin Luther King Jr., who convinced her to change her mind. He told her she was changing the position of black people on screen and had to stay. Star Trek had been a difficult experience for Nichols though. It was still extremely rare for a black woman to feature so prominently in a primetime show and Star Trek was a step forward but Nichols grew frustrated that the initial promise of strong storylines for Ahura did not materialise and her lines were often cut in favour of the leading men. She also learned that racism ran right through the television industry. She discovered, for example, that her fan mail was held back because executives at the TV company Desilu didn't want her becoming too popular. Nichols' experience of trying to break into show business had also prepared her for racism and prejudice. Part African, part American, part Cherokee and part Welsh, she was born in Robbins, Illinois, a town about 30 miles southwest of Chicago. America in the 1930s was in places deeply racist, but Robbins was a rare exception, having been established by a white man, Henry E. Robbins, he wanted to counter discrimination. He bought up tracts of land, which he then sold for a fair price to black and mixed couples who would otherwise have no hope of ever owning land. Nichols' father became the town's mayor. Later, the family moved to Chicago, where Nichols discovered her love of ballet, although racism would emerge again. People said to her parents, there are no black ballerinas, so why bother? But, thanks to her father's persistence, she found a place at ballet school. She also loved singing and began to sing professionally when she was 14. For a time in her teens and 20s, Nichols worked as a singer and dancer, touring with her first husband, fellow dancer For- Forrest Johnson, before landing a part in the 1959 movie, movie musical Por- Porgy and Bess. One of the stars was Sammy, St- Sammy Davis Jr., with whom she had a brief but passionate affair. She first met Jean Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, in 1963 when she was cast in an episode of his TV cop show, The Lieutenant, and told her he wanted her for the part in the new show he was creating, Star Trek. Ohura, he told her, was a citizen of a future United States of Africa and was a communications expert and linguist, but he had to fight to keep her in the cast after the network resisted the idea of a black woman in such a prominent role. The show was first broadcast in 1966 and quickly became a cult hit, but by the second series, Nichols was ready to quit. This was when she met Martin Luther King and, and in an interview with the Herald in May 2002, she explained what happened next. I had decided to quit the show, she said. The next night I met Martin Luther King and we talked about Star Trek. When I said I was quitting, he said, you cannot leave. He told me that for the first time the world saw, through Star Trek, black people as we should be seen, 
intelligent, qualified equals. He says Star Trek had opened that door, but that it could close again. For Nichols, it was an epiphany. It just blew my mind. Star Trek was the same thing King was doing. In a non-violent way, we were changing minds. Nichols remained convinced for the rest of her life that Star Trek was an important factor in removing barriers for black people in show business and wider society, and the 1968 episode Plato's Stepchildren was particularly important in this regard. In the story, Kirk and Ahura kissed, making it the first kiss between races on television. The TV executive feared the states of the Deep South would refuse to show it and wanted the scene removed, but the writers and Nichols fought the decision and won. Despite its importance in the fight for black rights, Star Trek was not a completely positive experience for Nichols and, apart from the Star Trek movies, she struggled to establish a high profile career elsewhere. She moved into writing and producing educational films for a while and worked with NASA to recruit more women and people from ethnic minority backgrounds as astronauts and the project massively boosted the numbers. Mae Jemison, the first black woman in space, said she was inspired by Ahura to pursue her career. In a tribute on Twitter, NASA said that Nichols had symbolised so many, to so many what was possible. She partnered with us to recruit some of the first women and minority astronauts and inspired generations to reach for the stars. Away from television and film, Nichols performed a one-woman show in which she played 12 famous singers and actresses, including Lena Horne and Eartha Kitt. She also wrote a couple of science fiction novels, one of which featured the Hura. In 1992, she was awarded a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame for her contribution to television. She remained an evangelist for the power of Star Trek and its legacy. It can be summed up in one four-letter word, she said. Hope. The hope for a better being. The hope for greatness. In a hundred years from now, I have a feeling we'll meet someone from another planet. In fact, I insist on it. Towards the end of her life, Nichols, who had been diagnosed with dementia, was the subject of a lengthy legal battle over her finances and care. One of the three parties involved was her only child, Kel Johnson, who was also her conservator. A hashtag Free Nichelle movement was formed in opposition to the court-mandated conservatorship. Nichols was married twice, first to Forrest Johnson, with whom she had Kyle, and then to songwriter Duke Mondy. It also ended in divorce. Herald Scotland recorded on Monday 1st of August 2022, Arts and Entertainments, Hippens, Scots Word of the Week, by Dictionaries of the Scots Language. Hippens. When I first recalled hearing this word, I thought it came from the language of the Scottish Travellers community. The Dictionary of the Scots Language, DSL, however, defines it as a baby's napkin, General Scots. An early record of the term comes from the Melrose Parish Registers of 1731, perhaps describing an orphan. The child had a day and night busking, brackets, leggings, close brackets, with it, some hippings, but no writ. Andrew Scott's poems from 1808 describes how makeshift they could be, to duds and tatters for hip and clouts. Trotter's Galloway Gossip, 1901, paints a very unsavoury picture. Busy washing dirty hippins in the grand punch bowl. Later in the 20th century, the Orcadian, February 1995, reported a recollection of the morning after the gas companies were nationalised, a day so distant that it had still been wearing hippins. Adeline Smith-Reed, writing in Scots about her memories of Portese in the 1940s and 50s for the Press and Journal, January 2017, recorded, Monday was I washing day, Dean with military precision. The wash house corner Byler left it, brackets lit, close brackets, a 4-7 in the fights, brackets whites, close brackets, hotterin' in the soapy water, a 4 we left for the squeal, like the driven snow they wap it in the breeze, heist it up in the twos brackets, washing line, close brackets, a bonny sicht, Petey Pie, the new wife, faz, brackets, whose, close brackets, mishwashing hippins or washing was the rank colour. Also from the Press and Journal, Michael McCosh wrote in May 2019, a relation chose the name Charnley for a newborn loony. I hope the mother's wheel stocked up with hippins. Scott's Word of the Week is written by Pauline Cairn Spital. Visit DSL online at https colon forward slash forward slash 
dsl.ac.uk by Dictionaries of the Scots Language. From the Herald, Scotland, Monday the 1st of August 2022, in the sports section, Ange Postelicoglu sets Celtic demands as he slams sloppy period in Aberdeen win by David Irvin. Celtic claimed an opening day victory over Aberdeen at Parkhead as Ange Postelicoglu's side raced out the traps to continue their impressive domestic form. The Parkhead side have impressed in league duties under the Greek-Australian boss who led him to title glory in his first season at the club last term. And after the 2-0 win over the much-improved Aberdeen team under Jim Goodwin, Postle Coglu couldn't be, couldn't, could have been relaxed and enjoyed a winning start to domestic matters. But instead, his relentless nature came to the fore as his quest for Celtic perfection shone through as he refused to excuse a minor sloppy period. Postle Coglu's Celtic mantra is, we never stop. And his comments after the victory show it's not just a throwaway line, as he was already targeting improvement as soon as the final whistle had gone. Question whether his side will grow to be more clinical with more game time as the competitive season gets going, he replied, The season has started. I don't buy into that. We've got goal scorers all over the park, so we need to be focused on all aspects of our game. And discussing the match and his wider work ethic, Postelicoglu explained, I think we started well, intense and pressing good. Then we had a sloppy moment, but we got back on it and I think this is the way football works. We can never be 100% every game. We want to be, but there will be moments when we we won't be as good. But we just have to keep our minds straight, have a nice mentality and get back on track. That's what we aim for and, hopefully, every game will be better and better. Imagine a person having a normal job and not wanting to be better every day. I cannot even find the funny side to that. And that article was by David Irvin. From the Glasgow Times, Monday the 1st of August 2022, from the sports section. England crowned European champions after extra time win over Germany at Wembley. A women's football story by Aidan Smith. England Euro 22 dream became reality as substitute Chloe Kelly's extra time finish saw the Lionesses beat Germany 2-1 and secure the first major trophy in their history in front of a record-breaking crowd at Wembley. Kelly prodded the ball past Meryl Forfroms in the 110th minute to restore the tournament host lead after fellow substitute Ella Toon's wonderful lobbed opener just after the airmark. Eight-time champions Germany who had lost star forward Alexander Pop to the injury in the warm-up, equalised with 11 minutes of normal time remaining through Lena McGull, and the game looked on course for a penalty shootout until Kelly's effort fired Serena Weekend's side to glory. A year on from the men's team losing the Euros final at the stadium in penalties to Italy, England can celebrate the first piece of major silverware for a senior side since the men's 1966 World Cup triumph over West Germany. And there was jubilation at the final whistle as the players tried to take in what they had done amid an almighty roar from the 87,192 crowd, the biggest ever attendance for any Euros match, men or women's. Meanwhile, Boss Weigman could save her back-to-back Euros success after overseeing the Netherlands triumph on home soil in 2017. Her record in charge of England after taking up her post last September has been near flawless, 20 games, no defeats, 18 wins, 106 goals scored and only 5 conceded. It was a third appearance in a Euros final for the team and first since losing 6-2 to Germany at Euro 2009 in Finland. The English women's game has been on a journey of considerable growth in the intervening years, with the sense of momentum certainly apparent over the last few weeks as Wiegmann's team has thrilled large stadium crowds and television audiences and there will be sky-high hopes for what the future holds after this historic moment. There was also a personal triumph for Beth Mead, who claimed the golden boot after finishing the tournament with six goals. The same amount as Pop, with Mead taking the prize due to her superior assist tally. Mead looks very much on for the accolade from just ahead of kickoff, as the big news emerged that Pop had sustained what Germany described as muscular problems in the warm-up, 
and was being replaced in Martina Voss Tinklenburg's starting lineup by Leah Schuller. Wiegmann, meanwhile, completed a clean sweep of unchanged starting lineups through the Euros. Her team then made a lively start, with Ellen White having a header caught by Frums, and the goalkeeper then just keeping a lofty delivery from the right from crossing the line with White hovering. Germany's Sarah Dabritz tried her luck with one shot that was headed away by Lucy Bronze and another that went wide before Bronze's header at the other end was dealt with by Frums. England fans then held their breath as a Germany corner led to a goal scramble which ended with Mary Earps cleaning the, bo- cleaning the ball. A subsequent VAR check found no cause for a penalty and there was also nothing given when the ball bounced off Schuller in the other box moments later despite appeals from the crowd. The Lionesses then went close in the 38th minute as Mies laid the ball to White and she put her shot just over the bar. Lewis Tecklenburg adjusted things at the break by bringing on Tabia Wasmuth, who burst forward three minutes after the restart, following a mix-up between Bronze and Millie Bright, but could only send a shot straight to Erbs. And there was another nervy moment for England soon after as McGull shot wide from a good position. Wiegmann responded by making a double change as Alassia Russo and Toon came on for White and Kirby. The manager has seen her substitutions pay off a number of times during the tournament and it happened again within minutes as Toon added to the goal she scored off the bench against Spain in the quarterfinals to put England in front. The Manchester United midfielder latched onto Kira Walsh's excellent long pass in the 62nd minute and sent an expert chip over Frooms as Delirium broke out around Wembley. The England mood swiftly changed to relief as McGill cracked a shot against the post and Schuller's follow-up was saved by Erps. And after exerting further pressure, Germany then got back on level terms when McGill received the ball from Vasmuth and poked it past Erps. Jill Scott, part of the England team in the Euro 2009 final, came on in the closing stages before the contest entered extra time, the first half of which then saw her survive a VAR check when she bought a Savinia Huth shot. A nervy atmosphere then gave way to another eruption of noise five minutes into the second half of extra time as once again a Wiegmann substitute made a positive impact and there could be no greater. Lauren Hemp swung in a corner, the ball came off bronze and Manchester City winger Kelly, who had replaced Mead shortly after Toon's goal, took two swings at it with the second going past Frooms. With Wembley rocking, Germany tried to hit back but struggled to muster much before the final whistle confirmed that the Lionesses' long wait for a trophy was over. And that article was by Aidan Smith. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 1st of August 2022, from the sports section, Livingston's Rangers red card tactics revealed as Shamal George applauds Ibrox support as a joke. Article first published on the 31st of July by Aidan Smith. Shamal George has revealed that Livingston had a game plan of getting a Rangers player sent off during their Scottish Premiership clash to help them gain an advantage in their season curtain raiser. David Martindale's side battled well after going ahead early through Joel Nuble, but a quick fire double from Rangers turned the game on its head. Substitute Scott Arfield struck with a header before James Tavernier bent a free kick past George in the Livingston goal just two minutes later in the second period. It was an impressive debut in goals for the former Colchester United man, but he admitted disappointment at not taking anything away from the clash at the Tony Macaroni Arena. I thought we played well considering how good they are, he said. We know how organised they are and how well they played, but it's a tough one to take. The atmosphere, I've never experienced anything like it. It's definitely one that I will remember. It would have been better if we'd got a draw or a win, but the team played very well. I'm just gutted for the boys. To be honest, I didn't really know what to expect, but Rangers were unreal. They were a joke. I didn't expect them to be that good. The gaffer said, You are going to be in for a shock when you see how good they are. And I was. Noble caused Rangers constant problems and at times both John Souter and Conor Goldson were struggling to deal with the big striker. George continued, I thought we were solid in the first half. In the second half, we knew they were going to have chances because they were going to come at us. We just couldn't keep them out. 
I'm gutted, but we have to move on. I thought we played really well. We should be really proud of ourselves. I played with Joel Nupo's brother, Frank, at Colchester last season. They're similar players. Joel's a real handful. I thought he was class. Three players got booked fouling him, and that was our game plan, so we tried to get the players sent off. Given how good they are, we needed to give them a disadvantage as much as possible. Unfortunately, we just couldn't get a result. George was also full of praise for the 7,000 strong Rangers support, who provided the best atmosphere the goalkeeper has ever witnessed. He added, It's a crazy step up, one I'll always remember. Rangers fans were a joke. Again, i never experienced anything like that. It motivates me to do better when there are people behind the goal giving you stick. It's something I'll always remember. To come back and win 2-1, they're a very, very good team. They played Tottenham the other day and lost 2-1. They beat West Ham. I knew, coming here, it wasn't going to be easy, and it definitely wasn't. We had plenty of chances. They had more, but, but we had chances to get back in the game as well. It's ifs, buts and maybes. It didn't happen. We have to look to next week. This is the second time we have played on TV. To me, it's massive, in front of a big audience. It's a massive step up in my career. When I came here, that was very important to me. I want to play as many games as I can and do as well as I can for the team. I have to repay the gaffer for the belief that he has shown in me and do the best I can in the time that I'm here. And that article was by Aidan Smith. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 1st of August 2022, from the sports section, Stunned Union St. Julie star admits Rangers YouTube deep dive over Out of This World Ibrox by David Irvin. Union St. Julie star Christian Burgess has revealed he and his teammates are thrilled to be playing at Ibrox next week after a YouTube deep dive on the atmosphere at Ibrox. The central defender, 30, told just th- that just one day after the Champions League qualifier draw paired the Belgium side with Rangers, Clips of Ibrox were being shown in training. Rangers enjoyed major success in Europe last season, reaching the Europa League final only to narrowly miss out in a penalty shootout. But clips of incredible celebrations at Ibrox in the run into the final have been shared far and wide. And Union St. Julie's are well aware of the difficult task of playing at Ibrox against Rangers with the backing in Glasgow, even if Burgess is still excited for the experience. The Englishman told the Daily Record, We're all excited at the thought of playing at Ibrox. The day after the draw was made, one of the boys came into training and showed us YouTube clips of what the atmosphere was like during last season's European campaign. It looked out of this world. So it's going to be an incredible experience for us, either way. We're just looking forward to it. The pressure won't be on us, if we're honest. We're not expected to win. With that crowd behind Rangers, we almost have sort of a free hit. But we're all excited, and especially myself. I've already had family and friends telling me they've booked planes and trains to get to Glasgow. I'm just waiting on information about tickets, because it looks like I'm going to have to buy quite a few. And that report was by David Irvin. Hello, this is your reader Jackie on Monday the 1st of August 2022. This is the Herald. News. Rishi Sunak, UK furlough triumph claim unravels. This article is by Brian Donnelly. Former Chancellor Rishi Sunak is lauded by his supporters for his role in the introduction of the UK furlough scheme during the worst of the pandemic. However, the job retention plan set out by Mr Sunak, who during some speeches was at risk of sounding as if he was funding it with his own money while welcome, was not the European leader after all. This week, former Brexit minister David Davis cites furlough and says in the middle of the Covid crisis, we had the best economic policy in the world. However, according to the Institute for Government, the UK's £68 billion furlough scheme was not the seminal idea it has been made out to be, nor was it the first in Europe. In the leading think tank study, it said at the height of the coronavirus pandemic, 
when many advanced economies were in lockdown, most governments put in place or extended existing schemes to support wages. Countries that adopted wage subsidy schemes were mainly those with no pre-existing scheme of this sort, including Canada, Ireland and Australia. Short-term working schemes already existed in Germany, France and some other continental European countries. These were made more generous during the pandemic. The UK is unusual in having had no existing scheme, but opting for a continental-style short-time working scheme rather than a broader wage subsidy scheme. It added Ireland was the first country to actually issue payments to workers on March 27, 2020. The UK, Australia and Canada did not start to make payments until the beginning of May as payments were made in arrears. The UK's 2023 growth is to be slower than every G20 country except Russia, said the International Monetary Fund. Furlough was maybe not so much the wondrous invention by the UK government, but more a catch-up to the standard crisis response. As the scrap for the post of caretaker Prime Minister sinks even lower, business editor Ian McConnell this week shone a light on the debate. What was striking about the largely cringeworthy debate on the BBC between Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss on Monday night was the Conservative leadership hopeful's refusal to acknowledge in any way whatsoever their contribution to the UK economic woes they talked about solving, he writes. Each seemed at extreme pains to paint a picture of how they would be the best person to be in charge in these grim economic times and to declare why the other candidates' plans were not the answer. He says that even taking into account his plan to raise corporation tax, Mr Sunak did not impress at all as Chancellor and pointing to Foreign Secretary Liz Truss's international trade deals that struggled to amount to a hill of beans in aggregate terms. This article is by Brian Donnelly. The Herald, Monday the 1st of August 2022. News. Royal Bank of Scotland owner NatWest pays out £2.1 billion in dividends. This article is by Scott Wright. Shares in Royal Bank of Scotland owner NatWest Group closed up around 8% last night after the bank unveiled plans to pay out £2.1 billion to investors in dividends. The bank announced a 17% hike in interim dividend to 3.5 pence per share worth £370 million and a special dividend with share consolidation worth £1.75 billion or 168 pence per share as rising interest rates helped first half income and profits surge. NatWest booked an operating profit before tax of £2.6 billion for the half year ended June the 30th, up from £2.3 billion last year, while income soared by 21% to £6.2 billion. The payout to shareholders come as households feel increasing pressure from the rising cost of living. Annual UK Consumer Prices Index inflation increased to 9.4% in June, and is forecast to rise to 11% in the autumn. Businesses are also feeling the effects of inflationary pressures, with the cost of goods, energy and labour rocketing. Alison Rose, Chief Executive of NatWest, said the bank was aware that the rising cost of living was impacting people and businesses, with the bank anticipating that the base rate, currently 1.25%, would increase to 2% by the end of the year but she noted that the bank has yet to see signs of distress among customers. Ms Rose said the bank's capital strength and generation give it the ability to support customers and highlighted that the lender had put in place targeted measures to support those who are likely to need it most. 
Asked by one reporter how the bank would respond to the man in the street who is struggling with the cost of living while it pays out bumper dividends, Ms Rose said, We are supporting the man on the street very clearly and businesses. We had £9 billion of lending in the first half. We are lending responsibly, making sure that we are putting capital into the economy to support businesses and families as they grow. The bank said it has contacted 2.7 million personal and business customers to offer advice and support on the cost of living since the start of the year and is helping people with grants under a £4 million hardship fund which is delivered through organisations such as Citizens Advice, Step Change and Money Advice Trust. Ms Rose said the bank is also freezing fees for small and medium-sized enterprise bank accounts. Asked if customers were spending less on big-ticket items or if levels of debt were rising because of the cost-of-living crisis, Ms Rose told reporters we are not seeing any increase in distress or debt or calls coming in for help and support. She noted the bank was seeing strong spending still in areas like entertaining, hospitality and travel in particular. On its debt and credit cards, noting we are seeing spending on critical items like fuel up 20 to 30 percent. But we are not seeing an erosion of cash balances because of that. We have a predominantly secured book. When I look at our mortgage book, nine out of 10 of our customers won't see an impact on their monthly payment as a result of the changing base rate because they are on fixed mortgages. NatWest increased lending by £9.3 billion to £361.6 billion, with Ms Rose noting that we are seeing growth across all sectors. Customer deposits grew by £14.8 billion to £476.2 billion. Shares closed up 18.96 pence or 8.2% at 248.96 pence. John Moore, Senior Investment Manager at Bruin Dolphin said, Today's results from NatWest show the UK's major banks are largely in root health, buoyed by rising base interest rates. An inflation-busting increase to the ordinary dividend combined with a special dividend are positive news for shareholders, as is the intention to repurchase shares from the government at a rate of up to 4.99% every 12 months. With the bank simplified, costs in check and its balance sheet in a strong position, There is an argument for NatWest to do something different with the cash at its disposal. Of course, inflation will remain a challenge, but one wouldn't rule out a strategic acquisition in the near future. This article is by Scott Wright. From the Herald, Tuesday the 2nd of August 2022, from the comments section. Europe's heatwave warning. Extremes coming to Scotland too by Vicky Allen. I write this from the Dordogne, where temperatures hit 39 degrees centigrade in the first days of my arrival. A couple of hours drive from this spot are areas where the canicule, as they call the heatwave in France, topped 40 degrees for days, and where in the Gironde wildfires raged for weeks. Another heatwave, France's third this year, is forecast. Among the areas swallowed by the flames was a campsite we once stayed at, at the foot of the famous Dune du Pila, a giant wall of sand bordered by aromatic pines. Their scent is the smell of holidays. The trees, now turned to ash, are Scots pine, the same species that dominates our west coast. It can seem as if Scotland is a safe little corner of the world, but the truth is climate change is coming for us, and while the gauge might not rise so high, the fact that we are not prepared to deal with such a change will mean we do not escape its ass impact. Only last month we saw the hottest temperatures on record at 34.8 degrees centigrade, 
in the Scottish borders. The risk rating for wildfires in part of Scotland was raised to very high. And in recent weeks, SEPA put out an alert around water scarcity, warning such scarcity was a very real threat as a result of climate change. As the UK Climate Change Committee put it, when it launched a withering report assessing Scotland's preparedness for climate change earlier this year, over the last 30 years, average temperatures in Scotland have risen by 0.5 degrees centigrade, Scottish winters have become 5% wetter, and sea level around the Scottish coast has increased by up to 3 centimetres each decade. Further climate change in Scotland is now inevitable, no matter how rapidly global greenhouse gases emissions are reduced. Among the inadequacies, it notes, are the absence of credible plan to adapt farmland habitats and species to a changing climate, the lack of infrastructure adaptation planning, lack of plans to manage coastal erosion risk, and that the increasing frequency and intensity of extreme high temperatures are not being adequately considered in housing and building strategies. There's a prescience to the publication of Bill Maguire's new book, Hothouse Earth, in which the Professor of Geophysical and Climate Hazards analyzes just how bad it may get. While I'm anti-doomism, I think it's worth paying attention to those scientists who sound the largest alarms, and Maguire is one of them. Maguire, who finished this book in the last days of 2021, long before the current record-breaking UK heatwave, notes that while Britons may still celebrate summer heat, that may not be the case in the future. By the second half of the century, 40 degrees centigrade plus summer temperatures in southern and central parts of the UK could well be driving people out of their appallingly insulated homes and towards cooler parts of the country. He imagines a 2100 UK in which London is deserted and even the Westminster Parliament moves to Carlisle. He has also said, when our children are our age, they will yearn for a summer as cool as 2022. The reality is, he writes, that even if the short-term goal set out at COP26 to bring emissions down are met, the global average temperature rise will still be at least 2.4 degrees centigrade and quite possibly higher. But he is not without hope. If we carry on the way we are, he writes, a 2 degrees centigrade hike could still be upon us within a couple of decades. But if instead we act to slash emissions now, this rise could be put off into the next century or even beyond. Reading Hothouse Earth, I couldn't help but wish someone would put his book in the hands of Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss, who have seemed largely keen to keep climate off the debate agenda. What scientists like Maguire are telling us is that we have an enormous double task ahead, which should top all debates. We need to adapt rapidly to extreme weather, whilst at the same time becoming more serious in our efforts to ratchet down emissions. What are Maguire's answers? Mostly that we need to dramatically curtail emissions today rather than tomorrow. Unsurprisingly, Maguire is an advocate for forcing the fossil fuel sector to leave known oil, gas and coal reserves in the ground. He calls for the scrapping of subsidies to the sector and the ending of all new exploration licenses, as well as a carbon tax levy at the wellhead and mine entrance. None of the measures he recommends, including the wider call for system change, are that surprising. But there's a principle at the heart of them that, in order to limit the consequences of the climate chaos heading our way, the honest truth is, of every decision taken, every choice made, the question must be asked, is this good for the climate? If our politicians could start from this question, then we might stand a chance. This article was by Vicky Allen. From The Herald, Tuesday the 2nd of August 2022, from the Opinion section. Neil Mackay, from London to Edinburgh and beyond, politics has failed the people. Europe was on fire the other week, but our politicians have forgotten that and moved on. 
Now they can pontificate about mass poverty, global hunger or war for a while before doing precisely nothing again. When it comes to politics, there's a flaw in our analysis. We consume news in a granular fashion, obsessing on the detail of one story for a time, without seeing how it fits within the full spectrum of events. Often we cannot, as the old saying goes, see the wood for the trees. Step back, though. You can see the woods then, and it's a scary place. For the one unifying theory of everything is this. Politics has failed. No matter where you go in Britain, there's political failure. The failure is of varying degrees. The chaotic maelstrom of Tory rule far outstrips the zombified government of the SNP when it comes to sheer inadequacy. But in no place will talent or even mediocre competence be found. Nor does opposition sharpen any appetite, for Sir Keir Starmer betrays everything the party stands for, morphing Labour into some mere shadow play of conservatism. The collective response to the cost of living crisis is a mark of how lost our political class is now. They've no ideas, no solutions. Millions of ordinary people are about to go under this autumn and winter. But what do our politicians do? In London, Tories race to the bottom. Rishi Sunak, a multimillionaire incapable of understanding the lives of ordinary people, and Liz Truss, an empty vessel filled only with ambition, offer a society even more Darwinian than the one they've already created. In Edinburgh, the SNP pleads its hands are tied. It can do nothing without more money from London. In truth, there's plenty the SNP can do. The party simply has no ideas, save independence. And while independence can indeed be presented as an overarching solution to Scotland's problems, the party has singularly failed to make that case and singularly failed to govern well. Nicola Sturgeon says key levers to help he ease economic pain remain under control of the UK government. On this, she is absolutely correct. However, the First Minister also has a wide range of tax powers at her disposal. The SNP Trade Union Group put up a motion at the party's conference calling for more creative and bold use of these powers. The motion was excluded from the draft agenda. What more proof is needed of SNP lack of ambition and political failure? The SNP knows it has failed on the economy and it now faces the wrath of public sector unions. With wearying inevitability, the SNP deflects the blame it deserves, along with the Tory party, clearly, it must be stressed, by hiding behind the Constitution. What even is the SNP's economic policy? If a referendum did one day materialise and Scotland voted yes, what are the plans for currency and cross-border trade? Currently, the SNP simply cooks up grand ideas, then abandons them. As giant corporations gouge customers, it's a good time to ask what happened to the policy of a national energy company. Meanwhile, the seabed is sold off for green energy, which could make the people of Scotland wealthy. Where's the action on climate change now? Politicians mouth words like net zero, then do nothing. The Western strategy towards Russia has been disastrous. Sanctions which should have been targeted to bring down Putin's murderous regime have instead propped him up. Six formers with a rough understanding of history, politics and economics could have foreseen this. European nations can barely govern themselves. Political failure in France is so thorough that Emmanuel Macron, a man bereft of ideas and morality, dresses in the clothes of the far right. Italy's government simply collapses. President Biden, who should be seen as a saviour, is so incompetent he cannot stymie the America first iteration of republicanism. We are burying democracy through political inadequacy. In Chinese media, smirking commentators gloat that Beijing's totalitarianism is now proved to be the only and best way for humans to rule themselves. This way, ruin lies. The reasons for our mass failure, our full systems failure, is overstretch. The way our hands-off laissez-faire politicians have built the Western world is simply too dumb, too big, too cocky. 
Couple that with the collapse of the post-war consensus in the West and the social fragmentation caused by identity politics, and there really is nothing holding the whole damn thing together anymore. That's why we all feel this sense of dancing on the edge of the precipice, because that's precisely where we are right now. History won't find this moment remarkable, though. We've been here before. Some months back, I likened the slow decay that we're experiencing now to the Bronze Age collapse, when civilizations in the Mediterranean went down like skittles in the 12th century BC. Perhaps that analogy was off. Maybe what we're experiencing is more like Europe in the 1600s. In 1555, the Peace of Augsburg was implemented in post-Reformation Europe, keeping conflict at bay on a continent riven by religious culture wars and proto-identity politics. Peace held for a while, but come 1618, Europe exploded into the Thirty Years' War, one of the most destructive events in the continent's history. Revolution came to Britain, a king lost his head. The 1600s were marked by chaos caused by political failure. Is this where we are now? Eventually, though, modernity and enlightenment triumphed for a while. History may remember this moment as a fascinating period to study, like the 1600s, but a time that wasn't much fun to live through. There's one optimistic note. Unlike our ancestors, we've the freedom to demand change from the ground up in a way they didn't. In the era of political failure, why wait for the so-called leaders to act when pain finally comes knocking on their door long after it's paid a visit to the rest of us? When politicians are of no more use, it's the people who must demand the change that's needed. This article was by Neil Mackay. Our columns are a platform for readers to express their opinions. They do not necessarily represent the views of The Herald. And that was this week's The Herald podcast, normally recorded in our studio at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre, currently recorded from our volunteers' homes with the publisher's kind permission. Thanks for listening.